again. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to jump into our sermon uh, today. Our sermon title is really talking a little bit. Well, oh, as we know, we are studying out the book of Mark. Okay, there we go. Who said that? Mission group, that's the Wells. <laughs> Wrong group, right? So we're in the book of Mark, and um, we had a great time. We got to hear from our brother Andre last week. Uh, when he talked about the transfiguration and what that meant for us uh, and what that meant for the disciples at the time. And so I kind of want to revisit some of that before we jump into this because I think it's easy to kind of, you know, the, the transfiguration like Andre shared is pretty much like a metamorphosis, right? He talked about, I think he used that analogy about a butterfly, right? The caterpillar, the butterfly, he had the book. Y'all remember the book? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Remember the book? Yeah. I was like, right? I was at the right sermon. <laughs> the sisters were on here. Oh, that's why. And the, brother, and the brothers are looking like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> says a lot. It's not a, that wasn't a good one. You should have put that one out there. <laughs> but, um, you know, with that, you know, he, he shared about the caterpillar and how that pretty much was them seeing Jesus in his ultimate form, in his glory. And the opportunity to see that was, I mean, that, that had to be incredible. And then, yeah, he posed the question, imagine what that would have done to your faith. Imagine what that would have done to your faith. If you were an apostle, you were a disciple, you are following Jesus, he brought you up on a mountain, wow. and you see Jesus transfigured. You see, and not just that, but who else was there during the transfiguration? Who else did they see? Moses. Moses and, and Elijah. So you see, you see two of the main, like the biggest prophets of their time, and then you see Jesus in his... I mean, he used the term ultimate form. <laughs> you know, you see Jesus in his glory, right? And then you hear the the you hear God say what? What did God say to him during that? This is my beloved son. And no, that's the baptism. That's the baptism. Close. Listen to him, right? Listen to him. You'll do well if you do what he says, right? Listen, this is my son. Listen to him. So you get, you are in there and you see all this stuff, right? Moses, Elijah, Jesus in his glory. God speaking. How should your faith be at that point? I mean, when you come off that mountain, what are you doing? Walking on water. <laughs> Walking on water. Right? You, you, your faith is, all, is through the roof. Right? Is there a God? Yes. I heard him speak, right? I heard him speak to me, right? It is, it is, it's, it's real. I mean, you would think that their faith is incredible. So we go from this mountaintop experience where their faith is like, should be huge at this point. And they walk down back into the valley. And here's the encounter we get. You know, the apostles up until this point lived pretty much by sight. I mean, Jesus blessed them with some incredible opportunities, right, to see and witness things. But not only to see and witness things, they also got to what? Experience. They, they did things too, right? Right? Before this, Jesus sent them out, right? Remember we talked about that? Jesus sent them out to go heal. They literally... Heal people and what else? Cast out demons. Cast out demons. I mean, they did, they did some incredible stuff. So not only did they watch Jesus heal people, feed people, do all these great things, they also walked around and did the same thing. So, and then they get to look at this transfiguration. Up until this point, the apostles lived by sight. But they haven't learned to really live by faith. And this is a really big thing that we're going to talk about today. Up until here, every experience they had was with who? Jesus where? With them, right? Right there, physically right in their presence. 
So everything they did up until this point, even if it was crazy and radical and out the box, Jesus was where? Right here. We know. And he, even if we went, if we went to another house, we knew he was right outside. <laughs> right? And he could help out, right? He, he was always there. That was really big. The power of God was always in their midst. Now, I, I bring this up because this speaks, this what we're about to get into today as we talk about Mark, chapter 9, starting at verse 14. This speaks to us in a great way because this, what we're about to experience is the first time the apostles had to do something and tap into the power of God without the presence of Jesus, the physical presence of Jesus. This is the first time they literally had to tap into the power of God without the physical presence of Jesus. And we're going to look at what happened. And why, why is this important to us? What do you guys think? Why is that important to us? <laughs> right? that's, that's exactly where we are. How do we tap into the power of God without the physical presence of Jesus here, right? And, and Jesus had to teach the apostles this lesson because he knew that a time was going to come, a time was going to come when they were going to have to really learn how to believe and have faith without seeing him physically there. He knew this was on his way. All right, this is about two years into their ministry at this point. And so, how to have faith when Jesus is not physically with us to help us to deal with the things that we have to deal with in life. I mean, right now, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but we know the world we're living in. It's, it's crazy. There's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of things going on in the world that we're in. And a lot of us, it's easy to kind of take a hands-off approach to these things. I got my blinders on. I'm, I'm acting like it doesn't exist. But as we talked about, you know, in previous weeks, that's not good, right? We have to learn how to spiritually engage these things. What does it look like to take these things and really discipline it under the cross and make sure that whatever we experience, we're going through it through the lens of the cross and having Jesus before us. This is important because it affects our faith. And that, we talk about like the yeast of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and who else? Herod. Herod. Okay, let's check and make sure people are paying attention. Right? Those yeasts, if we're not careful, it'll defile us, right? And it doesn't defile us, just our mindset. You know what it ultimately defiles? Our faith. It defiles our faith and our ability to trust and believe that God will do what he said he would do. And to believe that we could tap into the power of God. So let's go ahead and jump in this story. We're going to read through this. Starting in verse 14. It says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. And of course, you know who's always there. The teachers of the law arguing with them. Right? As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were what? overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about? What are you arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, and they could not. Jesus replied in verse 19, you unbelieving generation. Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy, they brought him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell on the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. I mean, this was an intense experience. I mean, you got to put yourself in there. We're watching a child here. I mean, this is an emotional experience for everybody. Watching what's happening. Jesus seeing what's happening here. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long 
has he been like this? From childhood, he has it. It's often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. But what? Okay, a lot is going on here. <laughs> a lot is going on here. And it's, it's kind of like what I said, even with the, how we're studying out the book of Mark, I've really challenged the church. I'm like, take your time. Take your time. Don't run through these, these verses and these chapters. But really take your time. Ask yourself some questions. Even ask yourself obvious questions. Sometimes we think things are obvious. I'm just like, no, ask yourself an obvious question. Why do you do this? You might have heard a sermon or think you know the answer, but you know what? Sometimes when you ask yourself that, you look at it, it's like you see things differently. Some things pop out to you. You know, you ever ask why was Jesus so frustrated with their response? I mean, what, what, what was his reply to them when they, when they talked about the faith thing? What did he say? He called them what? An unbelieving generation. And then he asked himself a rhetorical question. And what was that? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> well, come on put up with you. I mean, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's said, it, you know, when you read it in, in, the, in the Greek, it's said with like an exasperation. Like a, like a, you know? You know when you do the, right? Y'all know that, right? Y'all know that, right? The, like, you know what I mean? You gotta go in. He's like, how long will I have to put up with you? Why do you think this was so belaboring on Jesus? Like, why, why do you think he was so exasperated by their unbelief. Yeah, who said that? Yeah, it's been two years. Right? Two years with a lot of stuff saying incredible things, right? Yeah. So many miracles. Two years. Can you imagine two years worth of miracles? Some of us are like, just give me one. <laughs> All right? Just let me see one miracle, right? They had two years full of experiences, teaching, seeing incredible things, and participating in incredible things, and yet they are still where? Yeah. You know, this is exhausting, but you know what really makes it tough? A lack of trust is a hard thing to handle, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about relationships. You ever been, you know, a relationship and someone didn't trust you? Mm -hmm. Oh my, like that's, that is hard yeah. to deal with. To A, be in a relationship with someone that you don't trust, mm -hmm. and to B, be in a relationship with someone who, they don't trust you. Yeah. So every day, what are you feeling? Every time you're walking around with them, what is, what's, is there's this weight, yeah. Yeah. right? Like, like they're questioning everything I do. It's nothing I do. Especially now, can you imagine if you are the son of God and everything you've done is nothing but good and they're still like, I don't really know. Can you really? If you can... You know, even, even in this time, you got to remember we talked about like the regions and where Jesus was traveling through in Mark. He's been in this area for the longest extent of time. Like, he spent some time there. So it wasn't just the apostles who knew what Jesus could do. Everybody in that region knew what Jesus could do. And he's like, you don't trust me. And I've done nothing but good. You don't trust me. I've, I've been here. You don't trust me. Lack of trust is hard. Wrong assumptions, accusations being thrown at you. This stuff is difficult, right? And some of us have been in positions where we've been the person, right, who someone didn't trust, right? And you're probably trying to earn the trust back. You're trying to do something, and they don't trust you. Some of us have been the person that don't trust them, right? <laughs> and, 
And we know that, and you know, when you don't trust someone, yeah. you know how you treat them. Right? Yeah. When you don't really believe they are who they say they are, how do you treat people like that? Oh, it's always that side eye, right? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. Let's see. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's what you always say. You know what I mean? You know? Like, you know that, that you know the weight you put on people you don't trust. That was the same weight they were putting on Jesus. And that's why it was exhausting for him. Like, how much more? How much more do I have to do? You know, it's exasperating. And so Jesus had to suffer the wounds inflicted on him by his enemies, but he also had to suffer the wounds inflicted on him by the lack of trust of his disciples. That is painful. And that was real. That was something he had to deal with. And again, this is why I say it's always good to just ask yourself some obvious questions when reading the scriptures. Like, why was it? Why was he so mad? Because he was kind of mad there, right? I know when I first read through it, I'm like, yo, Jesus, okay, you know, you know they're just humans, right? Like, <laughs> you're coming to say. But then when you really put it in, remember, he was fully, he was fully human, fully divine, right? Real emotions. We do not, we know the way we put on people we don't trust them. And that's the same way that would be levied on him. You know, and here's the thing with the, with the apostles, right? They were able to do, you know, so here we got the experience where, you know, they're trying to cast out a demon, right, from the child. Have the apostles cast out demons before? Yes. Right? They did. They, they, they've done this before. So why couldn't they do it now? What was different? Huh? Right? Isn't that like the only thing that was different? Well, one said later, this is when we need prayer and fasting. Yes. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to go, why are you getting ahead of me? Don't get ahead of me. <laughs> but you're right. You're right. That is, that is big. That's a, that's a major key. We're going to dig into that major key. But it, it starts with this component, right? Where was Jesus? See, when they did the other miracles, they knew where he was at. He was right in the area. Same region. He sent them out to town. He was there. And they performed some great miracles, right? But this time, Jesus was away. He was up on a mountain. Right? During the transfiguration, like Andre talked about. Like he was up there with that experience. Jesus wasn't with them. They trusted when Jesus was there, but they struggled when he was gone. Um, and so then Jesus engages in this uh, to confront this, this, this child with this, this, this possession. And when he confronts the child, what automatically happens to the kid? Falls down the floor violently, convulsing. And, and this is huge. Because you got to put yourself in here. Again, I always say put yourself in the story. Put yourself in the story. For those who have children, put yourself in the story. This is your child. This is your child. Being thrown on the floor, convulsive. You don't know what's going on. It's deep. I love the, the, the question Jesus asks. It's kind of a unique question when you think about it, right? He says, uh, what was the question? He said, how long? How long has he been like this? <laughs> Did Jesus know that answer already? Yeah. So why did he ask? Okay, we have those who are listening. I think it was for the dad. Mm. Um, maybe to bring to the surface how long he's been dealing with this issue and, yeah. and living in hopelessness. Yeah. And this is so, this was, this was really big. I actually stepped back and I thought about that. Because Jesus knew the answer to this question. You know, but they, they, they talk about this. Even with counseling and, and doctors, you know, it's always good to, to ask certain questions, leading questions, not necessarily just to gather information, but also to create what? Awareness. Well, awareness or connection. I think what Dani shared is really deep. It, this, what was going on with the child wasn't just causing harm to the child. It was causing harm to who else? The whole family, everyone was feeling this. 
How long have you been going through this? And what's so unique here that we just bypass it is just information. I'm just, I'm just accessing information, accessing information, and we don't tap into the humanity. We miss the compassion of Jesus. We miss, we miss the compassion here. You see that he, he really cares about the pain. He cares about their struggle. He cares about the journey. He's like, I want to know. He could have just bypassed him. He was like, okay, let me just heal this boy. Deal with all that later. He's like, I, I want to heal you too. I want to hear you too. And I feel like, you know, we're in a time, especially this day and age where we're at, where it's really easy as Christians to not levy the compassion that God called us to levy in the world. We have a lot of opinions, a lot of judgment calls. We like to draw the line on things. I mean, there's some tragedies that are going on today, the, the shooting uh, out in Texas and different things. It breaks my heart. The first thing I hear is people want to talk about, uh, don't do this and do this and don't do that. And I'm like, you know, people lost their lives. Can we talk about that? Can the church do, let, let's, 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 let's be honest, let's, let's deal with, they are hurting people. You gotta have compassion. You gotta have compassion. Jesus could have stopped and addressed the issue, but he levied compassion. He leaned into understanding. He didn't even have to understand, he already understood. He didn't have to ask the questions, he already knew the answer. But he valued connection. Do we value that? Do we value connection? Is everything all about information and the right answer? Because, you know, there's nuance with this stuff, man. When you really connect with people, you look at things differently. Yeah. You ever, like, really disagree with someone on something? Like, just adamant disagreement, but they're one of your closest friends? Yeah. And then you ever adamantly disagree with someone that you don't really care about? Hmm. <laughs> How do those things pan out to me? <laughs> the person that you disagree with but they're like your best friend versus the person you disagree with on an issue but you can't stand them well, now, now you can't stand them how about this, you don't even know them right. you don't even know them it's leverage totally different right you know you give grace to your boy or your girl or your friend or your right but so and so it's like nah you, I, I don't need you right and now let's keep it real. Now some of us, I mean, even some of our friends, like some issues, you know, some people still, still do that, right? But it's, it's such a deep thing. I, I just, you know, there's a lot more we got to talk about, but I feel like I would be doing a disservice if I just ran past this and not highlight the compassion of Jesus here and how as Christians we should be leveraging the compassion of Jesus, probably even more so than we like to leverage the judgment of Jesus, Right? I think we gotta make sure we're, we're leveraging that and that's really important. But you continue on here, you know, and um, it's deep because the father admits that the demon is trying to kill his son. Like that's what he said, he said this thing is trying to kill my son. He throws him into the, what do you say? The, um, yeah, the fire, he throws him into the water and he said to what? Like as a parent, Do you understand like the pain that the, that the parent has to be feeling the helplessness right now? You know, Jesus is exasperated with the disciples. The, the father is exasperated with this situation, right? Like it is, it is zapped him. And I love it because, you know, it, you know the Greek, it says it's, uh, it's kind of weird how it highlights this in the beginning. When you translate when he first kind of presents this, he says, uh, since you can, will you? It's pretty much what he asks, Jesus. Since you can, will you do this? But in verse 21, he it says, it's kind of changed a little bit. It says, since you will, can you? Right? It's like a different mindset that's kind of changed in his process through the conversation. And this is the, this is the mindset that Jesus actually challenges here. Because in verse 23, he says, if I can. Right? Did y'all catch that? Yeah. You know, it, it kind of come off like, you know, Jesus, like, you know, come, you know, a little. Yeah, yeah. Jesus is like, bruh, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that street terminology. Yeah. 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 
But it's like, do you know who I, like, if I can, it was almost as though he was what? Insulted. Insulted by the question, right? Insulted, impudent. Now what, based on how we tend to read this, does it sound like the father was trying to be insulting? Right, <laughs> it literally was that, right? He just didn't know, it didn't sound like it. It sounded it sound actually, you know, I was reading it again, I'm like, man, it sounded like he's really like genuinely, you know, gee, if, you know, I know you, you know, if you can, it'd be great, <laughs> you know, he's like, if you can, if you're gonna, if you're gonna approach me, approach me with what? Faith and confidence. Doesn't the Bible talk about this? That how we should approach the throne? What does it say? Approach the throne with what? Boldness. Confidence. Boldness and confidence, right? It's in Hebrews. It talks about this. This is how we should approach the throne. With confidence, knowing that our God hears us. Knowing that Jesus listens. So he's like, if, if I can. Are you kidding? How can you doubt my power in my presence? Like, come on. You know, like, I got this. And... He goes on, he talks about, you know, all things are possible to him who believes, but this is the first time in the scriptures. He talked a lot about faith before, but this is actually the first time we see here in Mark where Jesus actually makes a point to illustrate the importance of faith. To really illustrate the importance of faith. See, it's about accessing the power of God through faith. He knew I'm only going to be here about three years. I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to be here for a long period of time. I'm not going to be here for a long period of time. I've got to help you understand the power of faith. And this is something I believe as Christians, I don't, I don't think that we really understand this. The power of faith. I think we understand the convenience of religion. I don't think we believe in the power of faith. I think we practice a lot of religious things. I don't think we really understand and leverage the power of faith. And I know that not just we, even me. It's funny when I was reading through this, I was like, man, I gotta challenge my faith. What are my limitations I have on my faith? Do I really leverage the power of faith? Do I believe that I'm accessing the power of God through my faith? You know, he knew he was gonna be gone. He needed to help them to understand how to make this impact. And this is where it kind of goes into what was shared a little bit earlier. The man makes an unbelievably honest declaration here. Unbelievably honest declaration. The father. After Jesus is like, what do you mean if I can? Da, 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 right? Anything is possible for those who believe. What did the man say to him? Y'all remember what he said? I do. He said, he's like, look, I believe. But help me overcome my belief. I'm like, how you say you believe what you don't believe? Like, what is that there? I'm a little confused. Help me to understand that, right? Um, you know, another way to translate this is, uh, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief is run to my unbelief and help me expel it. Mm. Run to my unbelief and help me expel this. Expel it. And here's the deep thing, man, with this. Jesus never expects perfect faith. He understands that we are imperfect people, un unable to bring in perfect, pure, unadulterated faith. At all. But he does expect us to bring something. He expects us to bring something. He goes on, he rebukes the unclean spirit, and then he talks about, you know, the... Uh, the apostles come to him afterwards and they, they ask him, like, hey, Jesus, why, why couldn't we do this? Right? And what was Jesus' reply to them? Yeah, some things come out through prayer. Some of this stuff is, is, is all about prayer. Now, let's talk about this real quick. Because it, it could be like, oh, that just means I need to pray. Right? That's the answer. It's got to pray more, right? It's a good answer. But let's leverage this a little bit. Un poquito here. He says, what does prayer show us? What's the purpose of prayer? What does prayer do for us? What is prayer? What is prayer? It connects us with God. It connects
connects us with God, yeah? What else? What does it show? Hmm? Faith? It, sh it shows faith. It definitely shows faith. It shows, it's just, I think someone said humility. Did someone, I hear that? It shows humility. And I, I really like that. It shows, and not just humility. Here's what prayer ultimately shows. It shows a dependency. Prayer shows a dependency on who? God. This is really important to catch here. The apostles were not able to expel this demon. Why? Who said it? They were relying on themselves. Isn't it easy to kind of rely on yourself after you've been taught something and you kind of do your own thing? So I got to, I watched this show, right? Don't judge me. This is uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Pimple Papa. Uh, oh. You ever watch that? Oh. Such a good show. I love it. I watch it while I eat dinner. It's very entertaining. Oh. And, <laughs> and uh, there was one episode I was. Now the y'all get y'all. Fix your eyes, all right? Don't be judging me. <laughs> all right? Jeez, okay? It's a very entertaining show. Go check it out. Anyway, she. Uh, there's one guy. This guy's a mechanic. Works on cars, works on all this stuff. And uh, he had a. Uh, what do you call it? Huh? A lipoma, thanks, man. <laughs> he had a lipoma, right? And for those who don't know what lipoma is, I was going to show a picture. Thank you. No. But I decided not to. Yes. <laughs> you know? And typically, you know, she removes these things, you know, you take your little scalpel, cut it, and. Pop it out. It's very intriguing, very interesting thing to watch, right? Mm -hmm. So the guy has watched episodes and he saw on YouTube how to do it, how to remove other poems. And he's like, well, I'm a mechanic. I do this stuff all the time. I've watched her do it. So I'm going to do it. So this guy, he, he had a few of them on his body. So he saw one. He's like, okay, he watched it on YouTube. And he went and got a scalpel and did it on himself. Right? <laughs> and went to remove a lipoma himself, by himself. How do y'all think that worked out for the man? It did not work out that well for him. You know, he ended up having a horrible scarring. It was a bad indentation in his, his thing. It healed really bad. And I mean, he went on the show because he had to remove some more that were on his back. He couldn't obviously get to his back, so he, he needed her help. And she spent half of the episode rebuking him on doing it herself. And like, look what you did. Look at how bad this was for you. You see this? That was not good. Look at you. She can't, I know, like, man, she keeps going at him on this. Oh, you know, like, she's really making a point. But it's funny how we can kind of get a little cocky at times, even with our own walk with God and different things that we do, where it's like, you know what? I don't need to pray about it. We, we reserve prayer for when? I've exhausted what? Everything. Everything else. All right, Lord, I need you, Jesus. Come on. <laughs> Take the will after I done jerked it around a hundred times trying to get it to go where I wanted to go. Now I need you, right? It's we it's so easy for us to not be uh, to not have an automatic dependency on God. We have a last minute dependency on God. Right? A last result. Especially things that we've kind of been through before. There are things where it was like, oh, yeah, I was dependent on God before this. But now that I'm here, I don't need to be as dependent as I need to be. Now I kind of got it, right? You ever have situations like that where you feel like, man, yeah, before when, you know, I was praying about God, bless me with this, God, give me this job. You know, you're praying for God to help you get this job. And, and then God, I'm there at this job. I'll be such a great example. Then you get to the job, and then you're not really praying about the job no more. Mm. Oh, you're praying to help to get out the job, right? <laughs> God, help me find an exit. You know what I mean? Help me get, keep these benefits while I do it. Like, you know, and, and you're not praying. All those lofty prayers you pray to get into the situation, you don't pray while you're in it. Yeah. Throughout the situation. It's so easy for us to get cocky. Right? The apostles had some great experiences. They saw some great things. They saw Jesus do some incredible things. They saw this. And then they turned around and thought that they could do it without what? And I think what Jesus said here was very slick, real smooth, because he pretty much was like, you tried to do this without me. 
And just because I'm not there with you physically doesn't mean that you don't need me. Mm. Mm. You still need me. You still got to tap into my power. You know, uh, I love how it kind of takes it a step further in, in Matthew 17. There's a little bit more expounded on this. And he says, uh, verse 20 says, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith the size, as small as a what? mustard seed, you could say what? To this mountain. Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, Jesus challenged the lack, the size of people's faith throughout the gospel, right? He challenged it Matthew 6, 20, Matthew 8, uh, 36, and Matthew 16, verse 8, Luke 16, 8. I mean, it's all through it. Oh, ye of little faith, your faith is too small, your faith is too small. Now, what he's basically saying is I'm not asking you to have a lot of faith. I'm not asking you to have a lot of faith. I'm not even asking for you to have perfect faith. It ain't even got to be perfect. You know, and it's funny because we hear this moving mountain. God, you know, preachers love to kind of like make this point. He's not really talking about moving a mountain. That's 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 not the that's not the point. It's not about moving typography. He's what he's saying is that there will be very difficult situations in your life. There will be very difficult situations in this world. Things that you would look at as like a mountain experience, oh, like this. This is weight. It's a heavy way that, how do I get rid of this? How do I get over this? How do I get on top of this? And he's saying, if you have faith in me, small as must see, you can move this. You can, you, can, you can make a difference. Faith can make a difference. The big point that he's trying to say with the faith of small as a mustard seed, and it's so simple. It's not even revolutionary. What he's really saying is not about how much faith. Not, you know, I, I even talk about like the purity of the faith. You know what I mean? We talk about how pure is the faith. What he's really saying is, you got that. Like you got that much faith. Everybody, take what you got. Everybody has that much faith. If you're in here right now, you have at least a mustard seed level of faith. Like, the fact that you're here shows that you got something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's what he's pretty much telling me. He's like, take what you got. It's not that I need more faith to go do this. You have faith. You can take just that little bit, that little bit of faith. And the crazy thing is, the way he illustrated it was with this man who was not his disciple. Matter of fact, this man came in, and what was his declaration? I believe, but... Help me with my unbelief. How much faith is that? <clears throat> that don't sound like a lot of faith. It sounds like a lot of duplicity. It don't sound like a lot of faith, though. And that man said, can you heal my son? Help me overcome my unbelief. I, I believe you can, but I, I'm struggling. There's a part of me, I don't know. I don't know, but I want to believe it. And what, what did that result in? Son was healed. Yeah. So the guys that were with Jesus for two plus years didn't see it. It happened. So what does that say about their faith? Y'all weren't even leveraging faith in me. You had your faith in your own abilities. And this is big, guys. You know, I I wrote this down here, and I really think this is so huge for us to be able to see this because. Jesus shows them that a new believer, someone who hasn't seen all that you have seen, someone who hasn't experienced all that you've experienced, has been able to leverage more faith than you. It's a direct challenge to them. It's a direct challenge of how we can get comfortable with our, with our beliefs and our, how we can allow religion to take over. My challenge to you guys is this. And it's real simple. You know, this sermon is not about, um, we're not learning how to cast out demons here. I want to be clear. This is not what I'm, I'm not teaching that, how to cast out demons. Uh, I'm not even teaching how do we change topography. That's not the goal. How do you move a mountain? 
It's not it. We are learning how a very small amount of struggle and faith can bring the power of God here on earth. Wow. That's really what we see here. And it's deep because when he expelled this demon, right? He said, not only like, am I expelling this demon from this child, but he also said what? He would never come back. Later on in other scriptures, he talks about how when you expel a demon that it roams around in you know, these void places, right? But eventually what? It comes back and it, it brings his boys with him, right? You know what I mean? It really jacks up the house. But Jesus says, nah, this one, ain't nothing coming back. That's an extraordinary miracle from such puny faith. Such a small amount of faith. And really, we gotta ask ourselves, where's our faith? Are we like the Father or are we like the Apostles? Which one do you look like? I don't know what issues you're dealing with, what issues you're trying to leverage, what things you're, you're, what mountains you're trying to move in your life. I know I got some. <laughs> I got some stuff. You know? But I tell you this. Our Father is a compassionate God. Jesus is compassionate. He listens. He knows. He understands. He wants us to bring it to him. And I'm not saying that this is going to automatically result in complete restoration in your desires being fulfilled. Because it's not about your desires being fulfilled, ultimately, right? It's about God's will being done. But understand this. We have access to a level of power that I think we could be tapping into a whole lot more if we really put forth the faith. It's not about grow. I need more. I need more faith. It's let me go with what I got. I love the scripture Bruce read for communion because it says, in accordance to what? Faith. Your faith. In accordance to your faith. We're all at different levels here. Mm -hmm. That does not mean the power of God is any less displayed in any of our lives. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's all about your ability to trust, believe, and go for it. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Amen.